Hello, and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I am your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I am joined by Colleen Clark. She wrote a dissertation called The Evolution of the Ride Symbol Pattern from 1917 to 1941. Colleen, how are you? I'm good. How are you, Bart? I'm great. This is really cool. This is, uh, I don't think I've ever uh, read a dissertation in my life. I feel like I'm uh, getting smarter just by talking to you. Oh, um, good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's funny. I mean, I, it's, I've had a lot of uh, people, some of the first responses have been, um, wow, how did you write a dissertation on six notes? And uh, I guess we'll, we'll talk about that today. <laughs> yeah, that's really interesting. Um, the amount, I mean, it's almost like you're zoomed super far in on a very particular topic. It just goes to show how the world of drumming can be, you can just go as close in as you want. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And uh, that was kind of what made me so curious was trying to trace this pattern and, and why and how it overtook our music and especially as um as drummers, but also jazz music in general. So yeah. this hopefully can reach uh, not only drummers, but jazz musicians um, across the instrumental and vocal um, board. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I'll give a quick shout out to Ben O'Brien Smith from uh, Sounds Like a Drum, who connected us just literally via a Facebook um, post you did. And he said, you should be on drum history. And um, yeah. <laughs> now you're on drum history. So that's pretty cool. Yes. Thanks, Ben. Ben yeah. is awesome. Everybody, everybody should check out Ben. He's the bomb. <laughs> yep, sounds like a drum. So, cool. Well, why don't we start? Um, first off, tell us a little bit about you. Like, you're obviously in school, so, and then we can hear a little bit about what got you to this point, and then we'll jump right in with um, the evolution of the ride symbol pattern. Okay, cool. Yeah, so I just graduated from the University of North Texas in Denton, Texas, uh, with my doctorate in uh uh, performance with a specialty in jazz performance, which of course uh, was on jazz drum set. And um, I'm originally from Connecticut, uh, but I've been living in New York for a long time. And so what, I mean, how I got to this dissertation point was, of course, from the influence of my many um, mentors over the years, uh, which started with uh, the great um, now passed away, um, Al Lee Pack, hmm. who was the timpanist of the Hartford Symphony for 50 years. He also founded the percussion department at the Hart School in Hartford, Connecticut. Um, and so I started uh, with him at a very young age and um, up until uh, he passed away. So I, I started with an incredibly brilliant mentor yeah and my my path kind of <clears throat> continued uh in that uh direction i ended up doing my undergraduate studies with uh the um incredible world-renowned famous marimba player gordon stout at ithaca college and then um i did a percussion uh degree and music education degree there which was outstanding and has helped um all of my music making and then i went uh, to SUNY Purchase and studied uh, with the great John Riley, of course, the drum drum set player for the Village Vanguard, among many other recordings uh, and projects, uh, has continued to be my mentor to this very day. And he, he actually encouraged this research very much so. Um, and then I was I was just playing in, in New York and doing the New York City thing, being a band leader, and um, I really wanted to take my playing and my research to the next level. And so I applied for the doctorate at uh, North Texas and uh, won a teaching fellowship there and was there for three years. And now I'm back back in New York um, and really excited to be sharing my research and, uh, and playing and getting back into the scene again, uh, which I have missed. So. Yeah, well, that's awesome. So you're, you're very well educated, obviously, and, and passionate about this. Um, yeah, why don't you start out with um, just running us through everything you learned about the evolution of the ride symbol pattern? Okay, excellent. Um, so, the um, what I was first curious about was um, was Kenny Clark. So, Kenny Clark is actually ends up at the end of my research because Kenny Clark was, of course, the um, ride symbol pattern manipulator uh once we hit 1941 which um we'll talk about later um kenny clark becomes you know the the uh innovator of the pattern and then of course the um 
also the coordinator of the limbs um, that we all are always trying to um, make more fluid yeah. as we practice yeah, <laughs> every day. <laughs> um, but uh, so my curiosity started there, honestly. And so I was trying to find uh, the very first recordings of Kenny Clark because I, I just wanted to know where he started um, and how he, um, you know, got to where he got. And then I kept going backwards. I really wanted to try to find, this is impossible, but uh, I wanted to try to find the first recording of the pattern. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, um, researchers always say you, you can't, you can't say that because that's, that's, that's a really lofty and dangerous thing to say, because of course there, there's always someone who's going to come along and, and disprove that. But yeah, I did yeah. want to say, you know, I, I wanted to find the earliest, um, or an early representative recording of the pattern. And of course that would begin with the original Dixieland jazz band, because technically they they were the first recorded jazz, um, band. And so, um, I have to start there and that was 1917. Now what also, you know, as you do research, you start with a goal and then you get to somewhere else that makes you curious about another thing, which makes me curious. So it's always a, a journey. So it's not always going to be a straight line. And this definitely wasn't a straight line because I then had to, to figure out how to show the evolution of the pattern, not on the ride symbol, because we didn't have, you know, a ride symbol until the mid thirties, you know, into mm -hmm. the early forties. Um, and I was so grateful to have um, Ed Sof, uh, who was one of my mentors in Texas, very graciously gave me the, the go ahead and the, the hookup with uh, CEO of Zildjian, uh, Craigie Zildjian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I, we were, you know, curious to see if there were records that showed um, when Zildjian started making symbols that were bigger than 16 inches. Um, and so, um, you know, we, we couldn't quite pin down when that, when that, production began um, because Zildjian had a big fire. Uh, I don't know. It was in the early thirties. So I think some of those uh, records were destroyed, but she, she helped. Uh, uh, she sent me some really, really beautiful and interesting advertisements of 19 inch um, symbols that were being made in Bucharest. So that's pretty interesting. Um, you could flip through and, and, and see that advertisement as well in the dissertation. But anyway, so um, I had to figure out, oh my gosh, where did this pattern actually start on the drum set? You know, um, yeah. where, what were, what surface were drummers using? Um, and what were they playing it on? And, um, you know, so anyway, so I, of course I had to go to the first technically recorded um, jazz recording. And um, so that brings us to Tony Sabarbro, who was the drummer in the uh, original Dixieland jazz band. And, um, there's a track that they made in November of 1917 uh, called Oriental Jazz, uh, and in parentheses it's called Sudan. And so Tony Sabarbro can be heard playing pattern on the wood blocks um, for uh, little tiny sections. So um, like from minute 110 to 115, 121 to 124. So just like five-second increments. Um, so not throughout the whole track, um, but in these tiny little increments where the, the band goes to this kind of minor little shouty thing. Um, and that's what he does every time. It's pretty, pretty interesting how he orchestrated um, that. So then I'm on that path of, okay, where did they put the pattern? But then there's also the path of um, uh, how they orchestrated it, where in the tune um, they orchestrated it. And then eventually when we get you know, later on, we come to the, to the, um, what we call the riding out, you know, the last shout chorus or whatever of a big band tune where we ride the cymbal and we play backbeat on two and four, that kind of a thing. Yeah. 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 Um, that, you know, that becomes the, the go-to standard, uh, in the thirties and into the forties. Um, so it's really neat to trace how we started from these tiny little increments of a few seconds at a time of pattern to 
oh my gosh, we're playing the pattern through the, basically the whole tune. Um, it's, it was really curious to me how that evolved. Um, and also who was doing it. I yeah. am really, you know, I'm a champion. I try to be a champion of getting to the root of where things begin. Um, and so, um, you know, and, and how, um, who, who was doing it first and how it was getting out there. Um, and I think that also, I know that I'm, I'm fortunate in that I have had great mentors. Um, and I, you know, like all great, um, musicians, athletes, uh, whatever, um, we are influenced and should be influenced by the history of what we are so passionate about. So, um, I think it's, it's our jobs as, musicians and, and especially musicians of jazz music, which um, is so deeply rooted in American culture, um, highly influenced obviously by other world musics, but deeply rooted in American culture, that it's, it's, it's up to us to be informed, um, trace back to the roots, and start knowing the names of the folks that were playing um, the music from the beginning. And so that was another big and important thing for me to do. Um, a lot of guys I didn't know, um, Papa Jack Lane, hmm. um, New Orleans drummer, um, a lot of band leaders that I, I was not familiar with as well. Um, so this is kind of um, my curiosity with uh, the migration and the geographic influence that drummers and band leaders had on the pattern as well. So that was something that was really interesting to me um, as well. So I, I try to show that it wasn't it wasn't only drummers themselves that were playing pattern and realizing, oh, this is really helpful to the music. But it was also band leaders saying, uh, yes, you need to play that at that moment, <laughs> you know, yeah. until I'm done uh, with this chorus. Um, there, uh, there's a great example of... Um, Harry Dial had had the gig with Louis Armstrong for a short stint, but there's a neat account of Harry Dial explaining uh, how Louis Armstrong uh, would specifically say, "You need to play the pattern, play the ride cymbal until I'm done." You know, yeah, exactly. Um, and that that kind of thing is really neat to me, and and that uh, example in particular was really. Uh, it was really neat when that was brought to my attention by, uh, of course, the Louis Armstrong um, uh, researcher um, and archivist, Ricky Riccardi at the, the Louis Armstrong Archive out in, at, in Queens at Queens College. So um, that kind of stuff, that's what really, really interests me. So that's what the dissertation um, kind of lays out. It's just saying this, is, this came from little, a little seed and then it grew into this massive, um, massive tree that we now as drummers, we, every day, we, when we sit down and practice, what do we do? We play the ride cymbal pattern. Exactly. So. And the thing I keep thinking about is, um, as I've learned from doing this show is just the, the, uh, the timekeeping pattern using your right hand to play on the ride or on the hi hat is something that we all take for granted now, but um, mm -hmm. that's not the case. That wasn't always there. Like you said, the original, remind me of the name of the very first guy who did it on the wood block. Oh, Tony Sabarbaro. Sometimes he'd go by Tony Spargo, but I went with Sabarbaro in the, throughout the dissertation. Cool. So um, with Tony doing it, and just having it be in those tiny little sections there, they would do the timekeeping um, with a brush on the snare, obviously, kind of like you think mm -hmm. of with a normal brush pattern. And then mm -hmm. it, it would expand from there. So um, I think that plays just exactly into what you're talking about here um, and just seeing where it started, where it went from. And then it does help every bit of the music to have an eighth note or a jazz pattern or 16th notes going along and chugging along with the whole song. So that's that's really cool. Yeah, absolutely. And it was, you know, um, Sir Barbaro and the original Dixieland Jazz Band, of course, they were from New Orleans. It was an all-white band that migrated up to Chicago. But, of course, there were there were other bands, black bands, black drummers that were playing the pattern as well. It's just, like I said, just so happens that um, the original Dixieland Jazz Band was an all-white band, and unfortunately, they were given more uh, resources uh, because they were an all-white band, and that, that yeah. was... Uh, 
that was the unfortunate truth. Um, but that brings me to kind of my, my unsung hero, uh, which of course is, uh, Kaiser Marshall. I was in, um, I was doing a lot of this research at the Institute of Jazz Studies over at Rutgers in Newark. And, um, and I came across this, I, I wanted to find, again, I was trying to search for earliest, um, representations that were audible, um, of pattern playing. And I, I got really obsessed with Kaiser Marshall and I stumbled upon this recording of, uh, Lucille Hageman, who was a, uh, New York, um, she was a New York singer and entertainer and Kaiser Marshall played with her, um, in the early twenties. Um, and there was, um, so what I would do is I sit in the Institute of Jazz Studies and I would just listen to recordings just all day. And I would write down any time I heard, um, the pattern and there were two really neat, uh, examples of, um, Kaiser Marshall playing with her. And this is, there's not an exact date, but it was in November of 1920. And, um, there's a tune called everybody's blues and you can hear Kaiser Marshall playing pattern for two, uh, three seconds at a time. It's pretty interesting, hmm. uh, behind her. And, um, uh, uh, just a side note, one, one uh, method that I used in the dissertation was I would, um, I would mark down the amount of seconds that the pattern was being played, where, where, obviously where it was being played. And then for the total amount of time that the pattern was being played in seconds throughout the track and then divide it by the total number of seconds um, in the track so I could show um, numerically how the pattern was growing over yeah. time. Wow. Um, and so, um, for example, Everybody's Blues, this track from November 1920, uh, Kaiser Marshall plays the pattern on the woodblocks for a duration of seven seconds, which is only 4.17% of the track. Um, but then when we're listening to Shoeshine Boy, which is the famous Joe Jones um, when he's playing with the Jones Smith Incorporated, which is, is Basie, uh, from November 1936, you know, 16 years later, he's playing pattern on the hi-hat for 71, almost 72% of the track. So wow. that, that was a big part of how I wanted to show that the pattern was overtaking the music. Um, and if I could do that numerically, I know that I could get more um, – more folks interested in how, you know, how it grew, uh, throughout the music, how, you know, how it was being used throughout the music. And I could very fundamentally say, listen, um, the percentage of pattern playing in from 1930 to 1934 is, you know, um, this much higher than from, you know, 1920 to 1924. So that's, um, that was a big part of, of the research and how I structured, um, this whole, uh, journey of the pattern. But anyway, so back to my unsung hero, uh, Kaiser Marshall. So he can be heard playing with Lucille Hegman in 1921. And then he just comes up, um, throughout, um, so many of the examples, um, throughout the entire, um, well, all of my, all of my work, but because he, he pretty much played with, with everybody. Um, and so, uh, but that was definitely the, the, one of the earlier, um, that's the second earliest representation of pattern playing that I found and it could easily be heard, um, uh, audibly was, was Kaiser Marshall with Lucille Hegeman, which is pretty neat. That is neat. Two questions here. So we should probably mm -hmm. define exactly what the ride symbol pattern actually is. Because in my mind, I have Absolutely. it as that, that classic kind of tss, 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 kind of jazz. That's exactly right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's yep. the pattern mm -hmm. that we're talking that's about. That's the pattern. Now, yep. my second thought is, is obviously, this is still relatively early in like the invention of recording. Obviously, I think that was in like the 1800s with like wax cylinders and all that. But um, it had to be kind of difficult to hear exactly what's happening because this is usually like, one microphone in the room picking up everything. So f I'm sure you can tell a ride, you know, when it sticks out or a symbol, but that's got to be a factor, not being able to fully crisp hear every single element of it. So did you ever have any like um, kind of confusion thanks to the actual technology of the recording? Sure. I mean, we're definitely, you know, the acoustical recording versus the electrical recording that, you know, it happens, the switch over of 
roughly 1925 um, is to, to electrical recording. Yeah, it makes a big difference. And so I was really careful with um, how I chose the representative tracks that I was talking about um, within the dissertation, because of course there are things that you wish you were hearing <laughs> versus things that you're actually hearing, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and so a lot of the, um, that's what was a little bit difficult. Um, it, it becomes apparent that I have a gap. Um, it's really from, I had a hard time from 1921 um, 23, uh, 24. And then I have a gap between 24 and 27 of like really strong, uh, uh, representations of the pattern. Hmm. Um, and it's really interesting because of course we've got those famous King Oliver recordings. Um, and, and I, I know Kaiser Marshall, I would assume he's playing pattern on a lot of those but it's really hard to hear. So yeah. I made sure that when I was choosing representative recordings, that they were clear to um, the quote unquote untrained, just meaning you hadn't been listening to hundreds of recordings like I had been um, <laughs> for a year, a year or so, um, so sure. that you could hear it as well. So a lot of the, um, the earlier recordings, especially I had to make sure that it was either on wood blocks or something really exposed, like the Oriental Tom that Kaiser Marshall plays um, again behind Lucille Hagman um, on the tune uh, Strut Miss Lizzie. That's from May of 1921. You can hear uh, it very clearly because he's playing it on an Oriental Tom, and it's very loud. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely, you bring up a very valid point that, you know, the acoustical versus the electrical recording um, is is difficult uh to hear and even uh when i was at ijs um at rutgers um i had help from vinnie pelote who's who is a um i mean he is the expert in uh i mean in all these early recordings in general um uh, and he he was bringing up the same the same point of you know some of the stuff is is difficult to hear what kaiser is playing um, so I had to be really careful with which, um, tracks, uh, I was going to point out for sure. Yeah. You don't want to leave any, any room for error of saying, well, no, that's just, uh, this or that, or the, the, the recording right. is too inaudible now. Um, so you're including, which is good to know the ride pattern can be like on a wood block or like mm -hmm. the Oriental or Chinese Tom Tom. Exactly. So that's good to know. It's just that pattern. Um, now. Ba yeah. Backing up, can I just ask you a very simplified question that you probably already answered? Um, but so it's it's almost just like a coincidence or like happenstance that this particular pattern that basically changed the world of jazz forever and is now a staple of all jazz music, it just naturally evolved into that, right? And that then it sort of just worked its way into the the, the history and culture of jazz. Yeah, I mean, there are definitely. Um other considerations, um, including the connection to African drumming, uh, the real roots of the pattern for me, and I touch upon this briefly um, in the dissertation, uh, but it's definitely, we can find um, a connection between the West African uh, musical traditions in the West African bell patterns, um, in that those bell patterns are played on a high pitched um, instrument. And again, we can see a, a relationship to the higher pitched cymbal sound um, where it could be heard audibly over, let's say, a big band, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, similarly, um, it's a repetitive pattern that has, you know, doesn't have alteration, of course, until we hit the bebop era. But what happens in the bebop era that makes it different from what we're doing prior to the bebop era is that we are dealing with dancers. So, um, and again, the relationship to, um, like, for example, the Iwi people of Ghana, uh, if we're talking about African uh, traditions, we're always going to have dancing and drumming together. And so um, there's a famous ethnomusicologist, David Locke, really researched the importance of the bell pattern and the Iwi people of Ghana. And he always, in many of his writings, you know, he's reiterating that the bell is dictating um, everything that's happening. Not, not only, you know, the drumming and dancing, but also the, the singing. 
So we have to remember that jazz, like I said before, yes, it's, it's definitely rich and it's deeply steeped in our American culture, but it's highly influenced by world music, yeah. uh, meaning other, other musics, other cultures, because we have to remember that the uh, birthplace of jazz is in a port, you know, in a port area mm-hmm. that was the, at the epicenter of the slave trade. So yeah. we had so many different cultures and musics and people coming through and influencing jazz. Sure. So, you know, this um, pattern, are, are what we're calling, what I'm calling, you know, the pattern of the, or the jazz ride cymbal pattern, it's really, it makes sense that, um, that, I mean, if we're talking historically and culturally, it makes sense that we'd have something like this dictating what the drummer is doing, you know, Got it. Uh, if we look back to the history of African drumming, for sure. Yeah, so it, it um, I was talking to Jazz Sawyer about the history of the drum set on a uh, previous episode, and it's he mm-hmm. discussed about how it's like the brass bands and the Janissary exactly. bands, and they would all kind of, it was just a big melting pot, um, which... Exactly. It's, yeah, it's, I listened to that episode. That was great. Cool. Yeah, and it's it's extremely true even today of different cultures blending together and all that good stuff. Um, so, so then moving forward here, when did it kind of become more like standardized? We've got our really early examples of it. Then there's still, you're getting up to 70%. Take us further there. When did it kind of become more of a, an everyday, this is jazz kind of thing? Sure. Um, I will come out and say that I am a Louis Armstrong fan myself. So I have an entire chapter dedicated to how influential he was and, and how influential his drummers were. And I, w- I, you know, I will say that um, my other unsung hero, uh, true hero uh, throughout this whole research uh, project is uh, Zudi Singleton. And um, Zudi and his influence with Louis Armstrong was really important because he was not only uh, orchestrating, but he was also using brushes right when they were becoming um, popular and a commonplace tool that, um, that drummers were using. So um, once we hit, you know, even... 1929 kind of um, Louis Armstrong with Victoria Spivey uh, and, and this kind of 29 through 34 arena. It gets really interesting for a couple of reasons. One, now that the brushes were becoming normal, um, we can hear brushes being used by not only Zudi with, um, with Louis Armstrong, but also, of course, band leader and pianist Jelly Roll Morton. Uh, we can hear Zudi with, with him along with uh, Jelly Roll making Baby Dodds use brushes, which he did not really um, particularly enjoy. So we've got that. This is becoming more of a normal thing. Also, my other sidetrack journey that I, I got really excited about was um, if if you've checked out the um, Ken Burns jazz documentary, I think it's chapter two, there's a video, a black and white video, that starts, or film, excuse me, film of Louis Armstrong, and he is live. It's really interesting. And he is playing, um, I could see the drummer behind him playing uh, with brushes, and also through the tune, and uh, eventually ends up playing the ride cymbal pattern with sticks on a tiny little splash cymbal on top, so you can visually see everything. Wow. yeah. Which is really neat. And then I try to, uh, once I tried to figure out who it was, it was a drummer that I had never um, heard of, which didn't mean anything, of course, because I don't know everything. Nobody does. Sure. <laughs> but it was it was it was someone named um, Oliver Tynes, and this was in 1934 in Copenhagen. And I thought to myself, "Wow, uh, either I mean, first of all, where did this guy come from? And he's over in Europe orchestrating pattern throughout an entire tune. Did Lewis tell him to do that? Yeah. Or what's going on here? So um, I, I get into a little bit uh, about um, Oliver Tynes. And again, it brings me back to that. Um, I think it was not just drummers themselves, but I think band leaders were saying, listen, I I liked how Judy did this there. Could you please do that there? That kind of a thing. So I definitely yeah. think, again, this is happening. And then once we, once we hit, uh, which is really important as well, the, the hi-hat and how that impacted the pattern, we're kind of full steam ahead. So 
the the high hat folks that we really need to talk about, of course, are um, Kaiser Marshall, Walter Johnson, Willie McWashington, who is lesser known, um, but uh, was playing with Benny Moten before his tragic uh, tonsillectomy uh, death. And then, uh, of course, Joe, Joe Jones. And, of course, Joe Jones ends up being the high hat master. Um, I think we can all agree on that. Pause there for a sec. What is your take on the invention of the hi hat? I think it was jazz. Someone said that um, it was he had a plumber friend who invented a kind of a, a piping to make to bring up the low boy. What's your research? What have you found out about that? Um, I mean, I didn't get too crazy on the hi hat. What was curious for me was the precursor of the hi hat which, of course, were, I mean, they went by a couple different names depending on which patent you're going with. But yeah. if we go by the, the Gladstone patent, um, you know, you can call it the, the hand sock mm-hmm. or the uh, badock symbols. And they're most clearly audible for me on um, a Monday date, which was a Louis Armstrong recording where he instructs Zudi to say, whip them symbols, Pops. <laughs> and he goes, you get it, you get it, you get it, you get but, and then they start the they start the track, um, but cool. that you know that I mean it's neat because it was an, an open and closed device um, which, which was patented by Gladstone. Let's see, September twenty seventh, nineteen twenty seven. Um, that was a precursor for me. Um, and then there's a great photo of Chick Webb where he's holding the the Gladstone contraption as well. So I I mean. And I also found the, what is it, uh, thanks to, big thanks to Jim Pettit at the Memphis Drum Shop um, for, for letting me go through his archives as well. He's got a lot of incredible, um, incredible old magazines. And in one of them I found in a 1929 Wahlberg & Oak, uh, which was a company, I think, out of Worcester. Yeah, they're still Massachusetts. around. Yeah, yeah. Um, they have a great, um, there was a great advertisement. They call it the perfection hi hat sock symbol, uh, which was ran for eight dollars and fifty cents, which is pretty neat. And then the perfection sock symbol pedal, which was just a low boy, boy you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know really how flash when the switchover happened. Um, definitely not an expert in that. Sure. No. And as I <laughs> but, said, that, I was like, well, we're here to talk about ride symbols. That's not what we're here to talk about. But. No, no. But I actually, I have a whole chapter dedicated to to you know, this whole hand sock, you know, transition precursor to the hi-hat and then the hi-hat itself, obviously. Um, That that pattern, that pattern is very heavily used on the hi-hat just as much as the, as the ride typically. Exactly, exactly. And, and it's, and it's really interesting um, because the, let's see, like, for example, uh, Walter Johnson, when he plays with uh, Fletcher Henderson, it's uh, 1930, October 3rd, 1930, um, he's playing the, the hi-hat for most of that track, Chinatown, My Chinatown. Um, and he's playing the hi-hat for almost 61% of the track. And then, of course, as we go on further and further um, through the, quote-unquote, swing era, most of the stuff is, most of the pattern is played on the hi-hat until, of course, the, the you know, the shout choruses or whatnot, you know, yeah. where um, where it gets really loud, obviously. I like how you can say uh, 61% of the song, you know, because you actually <laughs> have the number and the... Uh, I well, can, it's helpful for, it's for those helpful. folks that are more more centered in the math and science. I, I wish I was one of those, but I, I'm pretending to be. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 this is, this is great. So when we're talking about Joe Jones and his work with Basie, um, the iconic, or what I think is the iconic uh, track that one could reference if we were to pick kind of one hi-hat track um, is definitely Shoeshine Boy, uh, which was recorded on, on November 9th in 1936. And he plays the pattern on the hi-hat for um, essentially 72% of the track. Um, and the other 30 percent of the track or what or whatnot mm-hmm. is like he, little he would do uh they traded a few times and then he he laid out for the first i think it's the first chorus um but yeah he plays the hi-hat on the entire tune unless he was trading or not playing um and so that is a really solid indicator as to what was going on um, in the in the 30s? This is you know in the middle of the swing era. Yeah. Not necessarily on a track that <clears throat> I mean this is a, a you know a record date track, but um, that's definitely something that Joe Jones was doing 
and um, continued to do it and was, was known, um, you know, he was known as the master of the hi-hat, um, obviously. Um, and so that, and then once we, we moved, um, what, how I organized it was the hi-hat. And then I, I focused on kind of the splash symbol and then, which, uh, grew into the ride symbol. Um, and there are some neat and, and, um, informative, uh, examples of, uh, not only the stick being played on the symbol, but the brush being played on the symbol with, you know, playing the pattern on the symbol with the brush. And a good example of this is, um, a Jelly Roll Morton track entitled Shreveport. This is from, um, June 11th, 1928. And, uh, it's Tommy Benford playing. Um, and again, I like to try to bring in more, as many names as we can yeah. of, of folks that we should know. Um, and you can hear him playing pattern with a brush, um, on quite a few uh, sections of the track. Um, it's about 38% of the track, but that's a really neat recording because not only is he orchestrating, but he's also playing pattern with the brush on a different surface. Um, and of course the other, uh, example that, that I really love is with my old friend, Oliver Tynes, um, with Louis Armstrong, uh, in, in Copenhagen in 1933. And he plays, um, pattern with the brush on a small symbol and then he plays pattern with a mallet on a small symbol and what's really super neat about this is that we have video uh evidence of oh, this yeah. and if anyone types in to youtube i cover the waterfront louis armstrong 1933 or something like that you'll be able to see him do it and you can see him switch to mallet you know it's really really super awesome yeah that is cool. um yeah so um you know the the whole small symbol thing when I started the project, I, again, wasn't, like I said before, I wasn't necessarily thinking about all the different types of surfaces. So then I had to wrap my head around, oh, my gosh, so they're playing pattern on small symbol, choking it with the left hand. There were a lot of different technical aspects of pattern playing um, that I, I had to honestly learn about um, and then educate myself and realize what I was hearing on, on the recordings that I was listening to. So... Um, the small symbol, um, the duration of the pattern on the small symbol, it wasn't as high, um, as what you would think, because even in, I have examples from 1927 through 33, um, it's not w what you would think it would be during this time, because by this time I was, I was thinking, oh my gosh, we're going to have ride symbol, you know, all the way. Yeah, like, yeah. no, no, we weren't quite there yet, which is pretty, pretty interesting. So, um, which brings us up to the ride symbol itself. Um, and, um, you know, this, the earliest, uh, dare I say that I have found in my own research, I'm not saying this is the earliest example, just putting that Sorry, out there. Nice safe. But for yeah. me, <laughs> um, for me, a very clear and early, uh, representative example of, uh, a drummer playing the ride symbol pattern on a larger symbol, larger than a splash symbol uh, comes from drummer Ben Pollock with Benny Goodman on the track Room 1411. Um, and the pattern uh, is definitely played on a ride cymbal, and, it's, and you can hear it very easily. Um, you can hear that he's not choking it with the left hand. Um, and it's done one, two, three times throughout the track. So he's, he's doing it for about 23% of the track. Um, and again, this was brought to my attention actually by, um, by Ricky Riccardi again, when we we're at the uh, Louis Armstrong archive, which is pretty neat. He hits yeah. me to this track and, and this record. Um, and then what's neat about when we're getting into the quote unquote ride symbol section, um, I had to, of course, add in, um, China symbol because the China was also used to ride on. Yeah, um, and exactly. And it was a relatively popular thing. Chick Webb loved using the China symbol. And the, um, the recording that I really love to use um, for this example is Back Bay Shuffle by Artie Shaw, and the drummer is Cliff Lehman. And it's really kind of an interesting track because the track just starts out with Cliff Lehman playing four on the floor and the pattern for four bars straight, no alteration by himself on the China symbol. Oh, kind of cool. bizarre. Yeah, very bizarre. Yeah, so 
so then I, I'm like, why is this? So I'm, I'm reading more about it. I'm trying to find why, why it just musically doesn't really make sense. You know, <laughs> like what's happening. So then I, I was, um, I was finally hipped to the story that, um, Artie Shaw really loved um, Chick Webb and his band. And Chick Webb would do this often. I guess he would start off a tune just by playing four bars of time out front, you know, probably while the band was getting their stuff together and get, turning to the right tune. And he loved it so much that he made Cliff Lehman do it, hmm. you know, on this recording of Back Bay Shuffle. Yeah. Cool. And so this is a, a really neat example because you can hear him out front by himself. And then throughout the tune, he either pattern was either played on China or the ride symbol. And it's about 64% of the entire tune. And that's 1938, which is a pretty neat um, point where, um, because of course, then I, you know, in this brief overview, that gets us up to um, Kenny Clark with Billie Holiday. And um, it's, it's neat because, and I like to, end, you know, kind of end the conversation with, this because when we're talking about back bay shuffle, yeah, what did I say? We're about 64% of the time with pattern. When we're talking about I Hear Music, um, this recording from September 12, 1940 with Billie Holiday, Kenny Clark playing drums, it's a drop in, in amount of pattern played because when I was going through, it was hard for me to find um, uh just pure pattern, so no manipulation. So ding, 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 pure, not ding, 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 or whatever, yeah, you know, wow. okay. altered, um, going through this track. Um, and it's um, it was really, really interesting because there is a, a, a drop in pure pattern played because Kenny was experimenting with um, altering the pattern. He was sick of, um, he said, what did he say? He was sick of digging, digging for coal, um, four on the floor, you know, that kind of a thing. And he really, he was really searching. He was trying to find ways that he could add to the music, but push it forward. And of course that came, came from his, his, his buddies too. I mean, he was hanging with, with Dizzy and, uh, Bud Powell and Monk and all those cats that were, that were inventing bebops. And he was, obviously a big part of that yeah i mean it's pretty wild to think that even at that point they were already kind of i don't want to say getting sick of the pattern but they were thinking how can we then take this to the next level which is exactly. what drummers do um constantly all the time now let yeah. me let me ask you where does the uh the swish symbol or the swish knocker kind of fall into this because i know it's to me i look at those and i think of gene krupa playing them and it's kind of like a mix between a china and a ride a little bit so um and I don't know the full yes. full history of those, but that's got to be a part of that a little bit, you know? I don't know the exact date of the Swish Knocker, because someone else has asked me this. Um, With a quick Google, it says 1930s, you know, but what that's Wikipedia, so. Yeah, and I think, I mean, I, I definitely know that um, uh, Gene was a, a very big influence and help with uh, Zildjian, because I know that that Avita Zildjian had a, a lifelong relationship yep. with with um, with Krupa, and I know that uh, he was integral in you know making um, thinner symbols, and that comes from that's from their Zildjian's historical background um, sure. info um, on their website. So I know that that relationship was important. I don't know the history of that that okay. well of course um paul francis or steve maxwell or, or the, any of those guys are going to know the answer to that or, or john riley or you know yeah, yeah yeah um no it's just curious of uh it's an interesting because it's that evolution of this you know like you said a splash symbol literally growing into a ride is just a really cool way to put it to go from the tiniest symbol to what is usually minus a gong the um the biggest symbol so i just think it's uh mm -hmm. It's interesting to think of uh, of what they would what they would use to play the pattern on. Yeah, and and I know that of course um, there were um, like I was talking about before uh, with the the cultural and kind of and global influences that jazz continues to um, you know grow honestly um, grow with, and we see this at um, with so many jazz programs like the the what is it the Berkeley Global Jazz uh, Program, you know. Jazz is always going to be influenced by global um, musics and cultures and whatnot. Um, 
but definitely in the beginning, when we're talking about the, um, the first example that I gave you of Oriental jazz, there was definitely some Asian influences that were coming over as well. Because uh, if you listen to this track, it's is it this one, and then Strut Miss Lizzie, I think. But definitely um, the uh, tracks that have, it's really interesting, and this is probably another dissertation, but the <laughs> tracks that have Oriental in the name or suggest that have some sort of Oriental tom. So we're talking about those tacked toms yep. that were typically painted. Red. Um, exactly, exactly. So there's that. And there's there's also some sort of, like you said, gongish, China-ish sound from a symbol. Yeah. So definitely early influences coming from the eastern part of the world um, would would uh, even bring us through to Chick Webb and then of course to Zildjian and, and their swish knocker and then of course to you know the the uh, how it's used even today in, in the big band yeah. situation as well you know still to this day what I've always seen is the Chinas and the swish knockers and everything and originally like you said starting out would be um, Chinas would be just to be super loud and you'd be in a military band and you'd be in a parade in Mm -hmm. you know, early, let's say, uh, very early history, and um, it would just be used for that. So yeah. that is a uh, that is quite the history of, of the ride pattern there. Um, so now you stop at 1941, because after that, it becomes, my guess is it's more standardized, and it's kind of more of the norm. So it's not being, the evolution isn't quite as drastic year to year, right? Or why, why do you stop at 1941? Uh, I stop at 1941 because of Kenny Clark, because of the bebop uh, revolution that was happening. Because what 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 really happens then is um, Kenny Clark, Bud Powell, Dizzy, all these cats are so interested in the um, the creation of bebop, and the listeners are changing as well. So um, lesser popular. Uh, you know, bebop was less popular to dance to because it was it was not necessarily a dance music. Yeah. So, um, and and quite frankly, uh, what happens is once the pattern begins to be manipulated, it's less danceable. So more and more drummers are trying to play like Kenny uh, and play bebop, and the use of the pattern, unless of course they stuck with a swing era band leader, the use of the pattern declines got it so um the use of the pure pattern meaning the non-manipulated uh, pattern um is in decline uh because uh you know cats are trying to coordinate themselves they're trying to uh sound like kenny and max roach and you know they're trying to do that um that kind of a thing which is not necessarily as easy to dance to so the crowd uh the listeners changed yeah no that makes sense it's you get into that more like uh not showing off, but you get into that more, let's go as fast and be as technical and be as interesting as possible. Kind of like obviously bebop kind of transitions into what's that more modern jazz kind of sound. So um, it is less, let's make people dance. It's more, let's uh, let's make people think in a way and improvise mm -hmm. and all yeah. that. Let's make art. Let's make art. Let's make art. Absolutely. Wow. Well, this is awesome. Um, I want to tell people too, that they can find your dissertation, they can actually read the evolution of the ride yep. symbol pattern from 1917 to 1941, which is the name of it. Mm -hmm. um, if you visit Colleen Clark Music, that's C-O-L-L-E-E-N-C-L-A-R-K music.com. And um, mm -hmm. from there, you can find it and all kinds of cool stuff that, uh, that Colleen's working on and doing. Um, so, yeah, Colleen, I think we did it. I think we've covered the whole the whole thing. <laughs> I think so. That that was that was awesome. It was a team effort. <laughs> yes, excellent. And and for you to explain it in a way for us to all kind of uh, understand is is really cool. Now on the way out here, mm -hmm. what was it like to present this? I mean, were you? Um, I've never given a dissertation or seen one. I mean, that had to be a kind of a, a nerve wracking situation. Um. Well, I mean, like most things, if you've been working on it for a long time, you're just really excited to present it. Yeah. Um, and for me, um, I did it in, in two different ways. So, um, I had a lot of, um, I had a lot of amazing students at North Texas, uh, because I was a teaching fellow as well. So I was not only, 
conducting a big band of my own, but also I was, um, uh, uh, I was really lucky to teach the introduction to jazz recordings, so class as well. Cool. So it was really neat to um, to have so many of my students become curious about jazz um, that was earlier than 1960 or so. Yeah, um, sure. So that was a big big deal for me. So I was in in kind of their. Um, interest, I, I thought to myself, what is the best way to really present this um, that in a way that is going to make them more curious about it and excited about it? And I said to myself, that would be to play it. So what I did is I did a sonic presentation of essentially the representative recordings that I talked about, talked through today. Um, and so what I did is I did exact transcriptions Cool. of I think it was 12 tunes or something like that yeah it was 12 tunes um and so what I did is I had extensive program notes so I didn't have to talk too much and mm-hmm. we could focus on the music but um I had extensive program notes and and brought um musically I guided the audience on this um journey from past to present so I did exactly 1917 to I went I stopped at 1938 but um, so that they could see visually how the band changed as well, starting from a smaller group uh, situation and then growing into a big band um, and hear it as well. Yeah. Um, so that was the first portion of it. I did that in November. And then in March, I defended it um, in more of a um, academic setting where I, I stood, you know, stood in front of a room and presented um a PowerPoint and, and walked the listeners, um, through, uh, and I would play them little clips, um, and show them, uh, the, what I was talking about with the percentages of duration yeah. of pattern played throughout a, throughout a tune, which was pretty neat for the, a lot of the non drummers, uh, appreciated that. And so we walked through that together. And then, um, then I was, uh, then I was asked many questions. It was about a two hour, uh, situation. And, uh, and then that was it. I, they're like, okay, you passed. So. Wow, that's cool. I was <laughs> yeah. gonna say, I'm sure you did great. I mean, if it's anything like today, I'm sure it was a great explanation. And uh, for now, I think we're good. Again, everyone can check out ColleenClarkMusic.com to read the full dissertation and uh, and just there's cool stuff all over her website. So, um, Colleen, I really appreciate <laughs> you being here and um, good luck in the Thank future. You, now that you're out of school and uh, you're in the real world. Yes. Yeah. It's. It's pretty neat. It's great. I'm enjoying I'm enjoying summer, honestly. Oh, that's good. I'm sure. <laughs> so thank you so much, Bart. I really appreciate it. And uh, thanks to all you listeners. I hope you've, um, I, ho- I hope I've, um, you know, encouraged curiosity. Uh, and if you have any questions, please uh, check out the website. Absolutely. All right. Thanks, Colleen. We'll talk to you later. Cool. Thanks, Bart. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning. This is a Gwyn Sound Podcast.